This little laptop had a lot of expectations to live up to. In one video on my channel, I called the reveal of the M1 Pro and M1 Max MacBook Pros magical. Now I know I throw around that word sometimes, but when you use a product that astonishes you, a product that makes you feel like magic is the only way to explain how it can provide so much value, reduce so much friction, solve so many problems you deal with day in and day out. What else are you supposed to call it? We just surpassed the 15 year anniversary of Steve Jobs famous keynote where he unveiled the original iPhone. An iPod, <laughs> a phone. Are you getting it? In it, he uses the word magic. It works like magic. To describe how multi-touch works. And back then, that is exactly what it felt like. For me, that's what this 14-inch M1 Pro MacBook Pro has felt like. And in this video, I'm going to tell you why. To do that, we're going to take a look at the problems I faced regularly when using my 2013 Mac Pro and my 2013 15-inch Retina MacBook Pro. How did this new MacBook Pro solve those problems and make me feel like a new computer could feel like magic again? And how did its promise compel me to go back into debt to the tune of $3,000, something I vowed I wouldn't do because I could get by, even if painfully so, with my eight-year-old 2013 Retina MacBook Pro. Well, let's get into it. Battery life. On my 15-inch Retina MacBook Pro, my battery might last an hour or so before I'd need to charge it. You might be thinking, well, of course, the battery's eight years old, but it isn't. The battery was replaced as part of a repair program by Apple a few years ago, so its health should be pretty much top-notch, and it is. But the computer struggles to do so many basic things, multiple tabs in Safari, watching YouTube videos, editing and exporting photos. Pretty much anything remotely intensive would make the fans spin up like jet engines, and that would, of course, lead to rapid battery drain. No doubt taking the computer apart and removing the CPU and GPU, cleaning up the old thermal paste and applying new thermal paste, cleaning out the fans of dust etc. might reduce this issue. Fine. Even so, I think no matter what, I'd never leave my house without the power cord. If I forgot it, I'd be screwed. Power cord anxiety, one of many friction points associated with the battery life on my old MacBook Pro. With my new MacBook Pro, I have zero anxiety about the battery life, and I also don't have to limit myself to what I work on if I'm out without the power cord. I can edit in Final Cut Pro, edit and export photos, work in Affinity Designer and Publisher, watch videos on YouTube, and the battery just lasts. So that's a huge problem that this new MacBook Pro solves. I often find myself working at a coffee shop without thinking about sitting at the crappy table that I don't like because it's in direct sunlight or it's by the door where all the cold air blows in or the table isn't level or whatever the issue is. I don't have to sit there because that's where the outlet is. I can sit wherever I damn well please. And I'll look down at my new notebook while I'm working and it's just the notebook. There's no stupid cord hanging off of it, awkwardly draped over the table and lying on the dirty floor. It's just a clean, simple setup. Me and the notebook, no friction, the ability to just lose myself in the creative flow and focus on my work. And that's how it should be. And Apple knows it. And that's why they ditched Intel and made their own chipsets. Now real quick, if you're liking this video, take a second to hit the like button. And if you're not subscribed and love videos like this, hit subscribe and join the channel. I'd love to have you here. And let me know down in the comments what you love and maybe you don't love about the new M1 MacBook Pros. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. All right, so snappiness. That's the fun word we're all saying to describe how fast this thing feels. Responsiveness, quickness, zip. You open an app and it opens pretty much instantaneously, just like on your iPhone or iPad. I always thought my 2013 MacBook Pro was pretty quick, but it's nothing compared to this new M1 Pro. And this is one of those friction points that you don't really know you're experiencing on an older computer until you've had a chance to use a new computer. In transitioning away from my old notebook to this new one, anytime I had to jump on the old one, it felt slow. And that's where that fun little word we're all using comes up snappy. And the new notebook is snappy even when you're throwing a bunch of stuff at it. Final Cut Pro, a bunch of open apps, a gazillion Safari tabs. It's not easy to slow this thing down. And that's just one more thing that contributes to the feeling that this thing is frickin' magic. Ports. Yep, ports. Now here's the deal. I was fortunate enough to just completely skip all of the MacBook Pros from 2016 to early 2021. Because let's be honest, if you're a pro, especially a pro in video, those notebooks were a gigantic pain in the ass. I watched colleagues struggle with dongles and adapters and just a bunch of BS to do what they'd previously done. It was cringy, it was sad. 
and I'm glad I missed all of that, and I'm glad I missed the touch bar too. Okay, maybe it would have been kind of cool to try it in Final Cut, the timeline scrubbing thing, that seemed pretty cool. But how the hell do you reduce a Pro Notebook to just four USB-C Thunderbolt ports? No MagSafe, no HDMI, no SD card slot, and one port had to be used for power. So the return of these ports was pretty exciting to victims of the 2016 and beyond MacBook Pros. For me, it's just been business as usual, and I'm glad I've never had to deal with the pain and friction of not having them to then the magic of them returning. Which makes me wonder, Apple was pretty self-congratulatory in their marketing for bringing the ports that they took away back. So I'm excited to share that we're adding ports to the new MacBook Pro. We solve the problem that we created. Aren't we great? Well, they're the ones raking in billions from the sales of new MacBook Pros, so now sound. My God, does this thing sound good. That's one of the first things I noticed. On my old notebook, I couldn't stand listening to the audio over the speakers. It's tinny, it's all highs, there's no richness, no depth, no warmth. When you listen to this thing, it's ridiculous. It reminds me of my HomePod mini. And I know some of you audiophiles out there have your qualms with Apple's speakers. I'm not enough of an audiophile to get down to the science of all that. I just know that these new speakers sound rich, full of depth, they're warm they feel good to listen to instead of grating and borderline painful. And that's one more thing that makes this notebook feel like magic, a form factor. My buddy Nick did everything in his power to convince me to get the 16 inch model. In the past, I've used both a 15 inch and a 17 inch MacBook Pro, but the big difference was that those computers were my daily drivers. Sure, I'd plug them into a display and use them in clamshell mode most of the time, but I was frequently traveling for work and I had to have a powerhouse of a notebook to edit remotely. But now that I'm spending most of my time creating for YouTube and not working remotely, I don't need a maxed out notebook to reduce my pain and friction. I also have my 2013 Mac Pro as my daily driver, but I needed a notebook that would be perfect for working at a coffee shop, transferring and managing data on set, and I didn't want to spend four to six thousand dollars on a 16 inch MacBook Pro. And boy did I make the right call. This 14 inch is perfect for me, and part of what makes it perfect is the minimal bezels. This screen is plenty big enough for me when editing photos, watching content online, and editing in Final Cut Pro. Now don't get me wrong, going from an edit bay like mine with four monitors down to a single 14 inch monitor is not easy. I'm constantly toggling the inspector and a effects browser on and off when I do decide to edit more intensively on the new notebook, but this isn't very often. And with the amazing new sidecar feature, I can actually declutter my Final Cut Pro user interface by kicking the browser over to my iPad mini. And that configuration efficiency and editing increases dramatically. And guess what? Holy crap, it feels like magic. The notebook sends the browser from Final Cut Pro over to my iPad mini, and I can use it just like I would with a second monitor physically connected to the notebook. It's incredible. Now I'll admit Sidecar was a little glitchy when I first started using it, but the last few long edit sessions have been painless. It just worked. But here's where the real sorcery comes in. Final Cut Pro. Holy shnikes, this thing is fast. Playback, editing, waveform rendering and redrawing and exporting my vids, it's the miracle cure for my ailing 2013 Mac Pro workflow. I can just fly through my A-roll edits, drop in B-roll with no friction whatsoever. I almost never see a spinning beach ball and I never see slowdown in playback. Part of why I bought this notebook was because my 2013 Mac Pro can take close to three hours to export a 12-ish minute YouTube vid shot in 4K exported in 4K using the YouTube and Facebook preset in Final Cut Pro. Three hours! I ain't got time for that. You guys need to see my dang videos. I'll link to the video I made a while back going over the differences between this new notebook and my 2013 Mac Pro, but allow me to summarize. What takes three hours on my Mac Pro takes on average, less than 15 minutes on my 14 inch M1 Pro MacBook Pro. 15 minutes. That's not magic, that's a damn miracle. And it has allowed me to publish videos faster and more frequently, not only because of the ridiculous export times, but also because of how snappy, there's that word again, and fast it is when editing my vids. And I have found myself spending a lot of time working on my videos on this notebook, at my kitchen table, at a coffee shop, on my couch, because it's hard to work in my edit bay on a slower computer. The only real issue with working on the notebook for extended periods of time is the comfort. I'm sitting on uncomfortable chairs usually, or my ergonomics with looking down at the screen are no good. I can't edit as long as I'd like to because of that. And so many of you have asked, why not replace the Mac Pro with the notebook in your edit bay? I can't because this notebook can't connect to all of my peripherals. Four monitors, three RAID arrays, a sound mixer, an HDMI matrix, a bunch of USB hubs and peripherals. I need ports, lots of ports. And hopefully Apple drops some kind of Mac Pro mini in the fall 
so I can go even further into debt to rid myself of the pain and friction this 2013 Mac Pro is causing me. All right, so a few more thoughts and feelings from owning this thing for the last two months. I wish I would have paid the extra $400 for a two terabyte internal SSD. I got the one terabyte, and although it hasn't at all been a problem, I kind of wish I had two terabytes instead. It's really my only regret. I know a lot of you are all about editing from an external SSD when using a notebook. You don't want to read write too much data to the internal and shorten its life. You don't want Mac OS to take a performance hit because there's a bunch of extra data on the drive where Mac OS is stored. I don't care about any of that. And part of why I don't care is because I think that's honestly some dated thinking. Yes, of course, if you fill your internal SSD to near capacity, the OS is going to struggle. But if I had two terabytes, my organization skills and self-discipline when it comes to offloading data I no longer need, I think I'd be fine. The Mac OS wouldn't take a hit and I'd have a simple, efficient workflow when editing remotely on my MacBook Pro. But here's what I really care about. I care about looking down at my MacBook Pro and seeing nothing but the MacBook Pro. I hate having external hard drives hanging off the damn thing or making it so I have to plug into power in order to run them efficiently or not being able to sit on a couch because you've got an SSD hanging off your computer and folks who slap Velcro on them so they can stick them to the back of their screen no thanks, that's not for me. I want my notebook looking clean. I ain't gonna Velcro a hard drive to it. I'd rather edit off the blazing fast internal hard drive and call it good. Okay, so the notch. My honest opinion of it is this. Apple created a problem for what might have been a truly flawless notebook computer in order to, in a few years, come to our rescue to be the hero and solve that problem, making us all amazed at Apple's innovation and ingenuity, thereby prompting many of us who have put up with the notch to buy a new computer because I'll be damned if I deal with this notch for one more minute. Is it a way to get people to buy a new computers sooner? Could be. I mean, I kept mine for eight years. Maybe they want users like me to say, I can't not get a new computer now. They got rid of the notch. Oh, and pro tip, there's a free app called Top Notch that changes your top menu bar color to solid black to make the notch disappear. I'll put a link in the description. I've been using it since it came out and I love it. All right, so if I had to come up with one pain point this notebook gives me daily, it'd be that the black inlay for the keyboard makes it really easy to see dust and crumbs and dust, endless vile dust. I'm kind of nuts admittedly and hate seeing anything on my screen or on my keyboard and with the black inlay, I can see everything. So I'm kind of often cleaning it. I use a lens blower, link in the description, to blow the dust and stuff off. And if there's something stubborn in there, I use a small automotive detailing brush link in the description to clean it up. Oh, and if Apple could figure out some kind of coating on their keys that completely repels oil so that the keys look exactly the same as they did when you first opened the notebook up, that would be magic. I hate that in the right light, I can see where the oil from my fingers has accumulated. I know I'm nuts but it bothers me. So what else? I love Touch ID on this notebook. First time I've had it on a notebook and it's great. It makes navigating the web so much faster. I'd hate to not have it. This display, it's beautiful. Bright, vibrant, blacks are pure black. ProMotion greatly improves the viewing experience, but it's also one of those features that kind of just disappears, which is a good thing. And that's really all I've got. I'm so glad I waited this long to upgrade my notebook. I'd hate to be stuck with the 2019 Intel-based MacBook Pro right now. The resale value can't be that good, and even though day-to-day -day use might be fine, I'd hate to deal with Final Cut Pro, longer export times, and labored playback of 4K H.264 video on one of those machines. No thanks. If you're looking to snag a new notebook because you're in need of solving some similar problems to mine, look no further than the base M1 Pro 14-inch MacBook Pro. This computer has made me enjoy work again. I actually look forward to using it. And I'll admit, I find myself emotionally attached to it because of how much it's helped me reduce pain and friction in my workflows. It is an incredible notebook computer. And like Steve Jobs said about the iPhone in 2007, it works like magic. Now hit that like button if you haven't already. Subscribe if you love videos about Final Cut Pro, filmmaking, and tech. Click the bell to get notifications every time I upload a new video and until the next one, I'll see you all soon.